My first memory as a performer was in the area of athletics. I had a gift. I could run and I was coordinated. By performing on a football field or running track or playing basketball or whatever. And I became somewhat enamored of that experience of people cheering me on or applauding or whatever. If you score a touchdown in front of uh, 50,000 people. Uh, Growing up in the environment of my family was both alcoholic and artistic. What I mean by that was my father was an alcoholic and uh, he didn't get along with my mother. On the other hand, my mother was a, a painter, a published writer. One night, my father punched my mother out and she was covered with blood and the kids came down and the next day after this was all over, I wasn't talking. I was traumatized. And then another day went by and I wasn't talking. And this went on for years, through high school, three years into college, until I started to be an actor. So now I gotta talk. I'm an actor, you talk. I went through this major transition while I was at Brown University where I was no longer just a football player. My senior year, Within three days, I was drafted by the Boston Patriots and accepted at Yale Drama School. And I had to call up the backfield coach for uh, Brown University and tell him I didn't want to play football. He said, are you serious? And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm dead serious. I want to be an actor. And I started with an image in my mind of what it would be like to be a successful actor. My mother used to take me to the movies when I was a kid, and we saw all these Marlon Brando films, Streetcar Named Desire on the War Front. She would chain smoke, Lucky Strikes, No Filters, and watch and I'd watch Brando, and I, it was like watching a documentary. He was so friggin' real. It was like, oh, they just filmed this guy, you know. I didn't realize that you could actually study acting. Then uh, I was going pretty good there for a while. And after that, uh, well, I don't know. What do you really care, am I right? Brando and Montgomery Cliff, they were vulnerable, they were fragile. They were not on top of the world. They were losing. They had obstacles. And it was more like real life for that reason. And I had a lot of obstacles and I could identify with them immediately. Movies affected me deeply. Then I started to uh, act and I kept on hearing, be yourself. Well, who was myself? A guy who didn't talk. My tools are not operative. The language I was speaking was athletics. I had to do a lot of homework and I was really afraid a lot. But then I got this part at McCarter Theater and I was doing Julius Caesar playing Titinius, and I got afraid of forgetting my line. Thou read this to Caesar, thou mayst live. Oh man, I'm so traumatized by that. So what did I do? I started carving logs and I started painting and I thought maybe I shouldn't be an actor. I was too traumatized, the forgetting of my lines and all that. Stop. I knew that what I was gonna do was to return to New York and be a painter. <laughs> What I did was uh, I rented a storefront for $48 a month on East 10th Street between 1st and 2nd Avenue. 
And I had shows and I sold stuff and I was working uh, endlessly and accumulated a huge bulk of work. And I wasn't thinking about acting at all, only about my failure as an actor. I get a knock on my door. Hi, I'm Lee Worley. This lovely woman is standing on East 10th Street in Manhattan. She says, we're doing a workshop. This is after two years of not acting. And we're looking for men in this workshop. Well, what I didn't know was this workshop was a subsidiary of a, of a rather well-known company called The Open Theater. One of the most exciting ensemble companies in America today is The Open Theater. Their work, The Serpent, weaves the stories from Genesis with the contemporary themes of the assassinations of the Kennedys and Martin Luther King. It has been true up to this point that we've been relatively independent from uh, people's business, which has allowed us to make our own kind of theater and to make somewhat of a statement. It's not as strong as it might be politically, but it has been ours. I overcame one obstacle after another. I learned how to communicate. I became willing to communicate. I learned how to deal with fear, a lot of fear, a lot of trepidation, a lot of low self-esteem, like, can I do this? Am I equipped for this? I met it. I met all of these questions on my own by just confronting and sticking with my goal. I think, I think, I don't want to die in my sleep. In the beginning stages of working with the open theater, I had to have part-time jobs. I was a, I was a longshoreman. I was a dishwasher. I taught tea of flat. I was a bouncer, a bar, whatever. Uh, digging uh, uh, trenches for pipe. And I walk in to the reading with Michael Cimino, filthy dirty. I didn't think I was going to get the role anyway, you know, so I, I, but I wanted the role. At least sit down with Connie and try to straighten this out, huh? Even if you walk away, do you walk away friends? Because no one's going to care when you're lying in your grave. I get cast in A Year of the Dragon with Mickey Rock. I played Mickey Rock's best friend and his boss. Interestingly enough, Oliver Stone wrote the script. So he knew my work and later on cast me in Born on the Fourth of July. And check the stock for more dog food. Then finish stacking the potatoes. We shot this scene in the morning where I had one line and Tom Cruise pleaded his case for joining the Marines. He had a long monologue. I had one line. I just hope they send you to Europe or Korea or They can't. Someplace safe. Every Marine has a tour of duty over there. It's not like the army. And after we shot the scene, Oliver Stone came over to me and said to me, what were you doing, man? You, you, sh you weren't doing anything. I said, Oliver, I had one line. What, what are you talking about? He, that afternoon, after Oliver chastises me for not doing much, I got to do this highly emotional scene with Tom coming home for the first time paralyzed. Right. Looks good. Yeah? Mom, I'll get lunch. It's okay. You need some help? No, I'm okay, Dad. Fixed up a bathroom for you, Ronnie. Put a wider doorway in. I built a shower for you, too. We shot that, that sensitive scene for three hours, and every time I was fragile and vulnerable and came to tears. And... It's really great to be back in my room. <laughs> Good to have you. It's good to have you, Ronnie. After we finish shooting that, Oliver comes over to me, gives me a big hug, and he says, that was really great. I realized what he did, he did on purpose. He wanted me to be fragile. He wanted me to be broken for that scene, which I didn't know we were gonna shoot that afternoon. My career, the meaning of my career is that I have learned 
that it's okay to be uncomfortable, that it doesn't matter how you feel. If you feel afraid, if you feel brave, if you feel happy, if you feel sad, it doesn't matter. It's all good. That's what my career has given me. Performing taught me to embrace everything that's going on and not judge it. It's okay to be messed up. It's okay to feel chaos. That's the way it is. So what? Now let's make some art.